this uh, podcast about the life of Alexander, um, I think now is a good time to point out a trend with Plutarch and how this this trend feels like something of a of a problem um, here here with the life of Alexander. And something about Plutarch feels like this life insufficiently describes the man, and I can't can't prove that, but it feels like there's something missing. And here's something I've noticed about Plutarch is that he really likes to talk about the virtues of these particular people, almost as though he's writing a self-help book sometimes in a way. It's as though he's, he's writing about these virtues as though we should emulate these people um, in our own lives. And he does this to such an extent that it is almost as though a personal characteristic will have an, a ha, has a, du, a more direct effect uh, than it really does. It is as simple as this, really, to say that it is character over talents. You know, courage alone can capture the city. It seems to be almost Plutarch's stance if you if you read this closely. And and for a lot of the other lives, I feel like that's fine. In this life, though, it feels like something's missing. It feels like I I don't feel like I'm reading a biographer who understood how Alexander pulled this off. And it would be difficult to exaggerate Alexander's military accomplishments. Inheriting a substantial kingdom from his father, but his, the kingdom he inherited from his father was a Greek kingdom. He spends a little, he, he makes a, an example out of Thebes and brings all of, all of the Greeks in line. But from there, he, he defeats Darius, uh, king of the Persians, in order to get into what is now Turkey. Uh, he defeats him at the at the Battle of Isis. He besieges Tyre. He goes to Egypt and builds his city of Alexandria. He goes and tracks down Darius yet again. Darius dies. He conquers all of Persia. He enters the, the city of Susa, enters the city of Babylon, moves to the kingdom of Parthia, and goes all the way up and into uh, into um, Pakistan. He, he basically conquers the entire Middle East. He conquers the civilized world, with the exception of Far East Asia. So considering the scale of his accomplishments, it is in this life that I would have wished for a little more from Plutarch than just, he was brave. A lot of people were, have been brave. He, there is a lot more to it, and Plutarch doesn't give us much, or really anything to suggest what specific skill set he had that made him so much better than anyone who had come before him. So it may help us to speculate what traits he shared with other conquerors, people like Caesar or Napoleon um, or Frederick the Great. Napoleon, we know, for example, right before the Battle of Jena, was up until 2.30 in the morning in his tent, which was a hive of activity, of new reports coming in, his orders going out, last minute changes, uh, mo- uh, orders to march to a, to a certain position in order to engage the enemy right before this, right before that battle. And then he, he, you know, he'd go to bed at like 2.30 and wake up at 5.30, 6, and be indefatigable. And I wonder, Plutarch doesn't really mention once in this life what kind of organizational administrative skill set Alexander had, and he had to have had it. You don't pull this off without it. And Plutarch describes Alexander marching across the Middle East like it's nothing. The other talent that unites the great conquerors of history is the logistical maintenance of an army while simultaneously maximizing its speed of movement. And we get very little description here. Plutarch um, mentions this almost as an afterthought. This is not the point of this paragraph, but we get this detail anyway. The long and painful pursuit of Darius, for in 11 days he marched 3,300 furlongs. Now, that paragraph continues, and the ultimate point of that paragraph isn't that Alexander moved quickly. It is just how brave he was. There's, a, there's an anecdote later down about how he turns down a helmet full of water and how his ability to turn down his own refreshments inspires courage in his troops. So this, this fact of the distance they have traveled and the short time that they have traveled it, Plutarch mentions that as an afterthought. But luckily he did, because we can see after doing the math. Now, I use the modern definition of a furlong, which is an eighth of a mile. And it came out to about 37 miles a day on horseback across modern day Iran. That's fast. I feel like that's fast. So we can see he was quick. We know Caesar, speed of movement, Napoleon, 
speed of movement, crucial. Plutarch only gives us a hint at Alexander's skill for this here in a hyphenated clause on his way to a separate point. Another funny thing that Plutarch does is so casually transition into the occupation of Babylon. That entire march and occupation is reduced uh, really to this line, from hence he marched through the province of Babylon, which immediately submitted to him. And then the rest of the paragraph is a description of a of a particular anecdote there. But the actual campaign, and maybe they did immediately submit to him and there's nothing to say, it's still amazing that that's all Plutarch has to describe about the approach and conquest of Babylon. Babylon is the most legendary citadel in the history of the planet. Alexander just strolls in, but it's like he's going for a walk, I guess. He's flying a kite. Oh, I guess I'll take Babylon. It's pretty incredible. Uh, and another another example of the point that I'm making that Plutarch goes a little too far in crediting Alexander's success with some sense of abstract virtue as opposed to a real applicable skill set is there's this scene when Alexander and his troops are trying to take a stronghold held by a guy named Sisymithres and they're having a difficult time and Alexander simply asks is who holds the who holds this stronghold is this person a courageous person or are they a coward and when the person asks they are a coward alexander says then we should have no trouble taking it for what is in command of it is weak and that's it they take it right so plutarch goes quite far in crediting alexander's success with abstract moral virtue and turpitude but plutarch also attributes the success of alexander to something else something other than mere virtue and it has to be discussed because it is repeated over and over again throughout the life of Alexander. And that is that Plutarch unflinchingly references the taking of auguries, astrological phenomenon, and other sort of uh, mystical predictions that precede each of his successes. And Plutarch tells us about this without a shred of doubt or agnosticism. And so it has to be discussed because it's part of the life. Take this passage just before the beginning of the Battle of Gaugamela. It came to pass that in the month of Voidromion, about the beginning of the Feast of Mysteries at Athens, there was an eclipse of the moon, the eleventh night after which, the two armies being now in view of one another, Darius kept his men in arms, and by torchlight, took a general review of them. But Alexander, while his soldiers slept, spent the night before his tent with his diviner, Aristander, performing certain mysterious ceremonies and sacrificing to the god fear. Isn't that interesting? The difference in preparation for battle between the, the Persians and the Greeks. And isn't there something to be said, by the way, even just reading, forgetting whether, what we want to make of the eclipse and all of that, the fact that the Persians are standing there being reviewed in the middle of the night while the Greeks get to sleep, you know, getting a good night's sleep before a battle, I would imagine, has a practical effect. But on the, on the other hand, how can you not long to know what the hell these mysterious rites were? What the hell was he doing with Aristander that night? <laughs> Don't you want to know? Now, as far as astrology, as astrology goes, it needs to be said, this was credited well past Alexander's time, the um, general in the Thirty Years' War, Wallenstein, his astrologer was none other than Kepler, uh, the, the scientist who believed that the heavens move to a symphony. Kepler did his um, astrological forecasts, and based on these forecasts, they would attack or not attack based on, based on this. Um, and what they would do is they would look up at the night sky and look at the position of the planets and the position of the moon and try to sync that up with what they knew about past events and what they could therefore predict based on that. And obviously, you, qu you might you question the science. We're just talking here. But that was what they did. It's not, so let's not think that they pulled something out of their ass. They did base it on something. Another interesting moment when it comes to the um, occult stuff in this. That's, that's interesting. When he goes to Troy, 
he sac uh, Alexander sacrificed to, Min to Minerva and honored the memory of the heroes who were buried there with solemn libations, especially Achilles. So here we're, we're going to just read from this, especially Achilles, whose gravestone he anointed and with his friends, as the ancient custom is, ran naked around his sepulcher and crowned it with garlands, declaring how happy he esteemed him in having, while he lived, so faithful a friend, and when he was dead, so famous a poet to proclaim his actions. If you wanted to read into this passage, just having fun here, not this isn't a big deal, you could read into this thinking that Alexander believed that he lived at the time of Achilles. It's a weird way to say it if it doesn't mean that. What is this? How happy he esteemed him in having while he lived so faithful a friend. He's that is that is a sort of sentence you say if you believed you lived at the same time as Achilles, as though he fought at Troy, is what he seems to be saying. If he did think that, he is not the first person to believe that either, just like we said with the astrological stuff. Wallenstein believed it, and someone as recently as General Patton believed that he was a reincarnated general. General Patton believed that he had crossed the Alps with Hannibal and that he was one of Napoleon's marshals. Reincarnated. So Alexander would not be alone in thinking that either. Someone as recently as this past generation thought that. At the Siege of Tyre, he dreamt that he saw Hercules upon the walls, reaching out his hands and calling to him. And many of the Tyrians in their sleep fancied that Apollo told them he was displeased with their actions and was about to leave them and go over to Alexander. Upon which, as if the god had been a deserting soldier, they seized him, so to say, in the act, tied down the statue with ropes and nailed it to the pedestal. All right, so he sees Hercules reaching out to him. And the, even the people of Tyre think they've been abandoned by a poor Tyre. You know, it's in a horrible location. I think there's a section in the Bible where they get forsaken by God, too. You know, what, what, are, you, what are you supposed to do with these port cities? They naturally become flesh pots. And everybody, you know, in 19, uh, I think it's in 1911 or 1912, when the Italians started making encroachments um, to Ottoman territory, they bombed the hell out of Beirut. I think Beirut is only about 50 miles from Tyre. These places get shelled. <laughs> They have a lot of these islands in the Mediter Eastern Mediterranean, they get shelled. Uh, an example of another dream um, in the, the part of the story leading up to the Battle of Isis. Um, Darius has a dream, and here it is. He, dream he dreamed that he saw the Macedonian phalanx all on fire and Alexander waiting on him, clad in the same dress which he himself had been used to wear when he was courier to the late king. After which, going into the Temple of Belus, he vanished out of his sight. So that's the dream that Darius has prior to the Battle of Isis. But if we're not, if, all right, so we've already got some um, reincarnation. We've already got some astrology. How about some alchemy? Right before the Battle of Isis, Alexander becomes incredibly sick, either from fatigue or from bathing in this uh, river where the water was exceedingly uh, cold. And none of the physicians dared help him. Right? None of his physicians would venture to give him any remedies. They thought his case was so desperate and were so afraid of the suspicions and ill will of the Macedonians if they should fail in the cure till Philip, seeing how critical his case was. All right, so Philip steps in and does something. And there's this moment where Philip comes in with his potion. What the hell is in this potion, we might wonder. Well, we know what happens. Alexander takes it amidst by the way, accusations that Philip might be trying to poison him, right? So Alexander has to show faith in his physician. He takes this potion. Here's what happens. The medicine at first worked so strongly as to drive, so to say, the vital forces into the interior. He lost his speech and falling into a swoon had scarce any sense or pulse left. What could possibly have been going through Philip's head? He must have thought he was dead as a doornail. However, in no time, in no long time, by Philip's means, his health and strength returned and he showed himself in public to the Macedonians. What the hell was in that damn potion? <laughs> Imagine that. He takes a concoction that more or less kills him. And then all of a sudden he bounces back and he's fine. You gotta wonder. I find it so fascinating to speculate at what these arcane 
remedies of the ancients were. I wish I had a more of a chemical background, more of a scientific background. Unfortunately, I'm just a silly old lawyer. But that's fascinating. What could possibly have been in that thing? Um, and back to the beginning of the of the life of Alexander. Um, his mother, Olympias, was from Samothrace. Um, and, and Plutarch writes that um, he was in that Philip, Alexander's father, was initiated in the religious ceremonies of the country. The night before the consummation of their marriage, she dreamed that a thunderbolt fell upon her body, which kindled a great fire, whose divided flames dispersed themselves all about and then were extinguished. That's the dream she has the night before the consummation of her marriage. A thunderbolt hits her and then there's a fire. Now, of course, we don't get to hear it from her mouth, so we don't get to ask her how that felt sensationally to her to have a dream about getting hit by a, f a thunderbolt that subsequently kindles a great fire. But this woman may capture our imagination, for she is described as an enchantress, and Plutarch says that women of her part of the country imitate the, with particular enthusiasm the Orphic rites and the wild um, frenzies of Bacchus. So this woman is particularly prone to the wonders of Greek mysteries. This is Alexander's mother. Let's look at this line. She imitated in many things the practices of the Adonian and Thracian women about Mount Hymus, which is where Plutarch says we get this wonderful word, word Thrasaeus, which means to be too superstitiously devoted to the ceremonies of the gods. So Alexander's mother is particularly superstitious, ceremonial, astrological, mystical. The close etymological resemblance of this word to the word to thresh threshing. Again, this to us should almost have an alchemical reference. This is mentioned in the Bible, the concept of threshing. On the threshing floor, wheat is um, separated from chaff, and it is frequently used as a metaphor for purification or for the separation of the just and the unjust. We are judged on the threshing floor. The fact that it is likened to a physical uh, separative process is, is what gives it a certain alchemical quality. Part of what alchemy is, is a, is a purification of substance and the pursuit of, of purified substances, whether it's creating gold or um, any sort of uh, medicine or anything. Al alchemy uh, pertains to this kind of, of process that is not just a physical scientific one, but a metaphorical one, a spiritual one, dare I say, a sexual and sensory one for the, the process towards our journey towards transcendence, purification, and so forth. And that Olympias zealously affecting these fanatical and enthusiastic inspirations to perform them with more barbaric dread was wont in the dances proper to these ceremonies to have great tame serpents about her, which sometimes creeping out of the ivy in the mystic fans, sometimes winding themselves about the sacred spears and the women's chaplets made a spectacle which men could not look upon without terror. How phenomenal is that whole passage? And so also just to kind of start to bring this podcast to a close, there's other portions of this where Plutarch describes Alexander as giving off a very sweet odor, which is a bizarre detail, right? So it, we might start to wonder what kind of occult, cultic presence Alexander had, what kind of loyalty he inspired from people. So we get this concept of, his, of the, an odor that he gives off just from his flesh. Then this is, there's another scene. Um, when they get to this, when they get to Ecbatana, and they come across this substance, uh, NAFTA, which seems to be a highly flammable substance that causes them to conduct experiments with it. That if it comes anywhere close to anything light or, um, or on fire, it just bursts into flames, this NAFTA. And so they do an experiment spilling it through the streets, and they light it, and it, and it, and it lights up in fire. Um, and then they, somebody <laughs> named Stephanus, who, and it is relevant that he is, has a ridiculously ugly face, 
writes Plutarch, volunteers to be covered in this highly flammable stuff. And <laughs> not surprisingly, he becomes engulfed in flames and they have to put him out with, with water buckets. And he's, it took him a long time to recover. What kind of, what kind of inspiration was there? This kid volunteered, according to Plutarch, the youth readily consented to undergo the trial. And as soon as he uh, was anointed and rubbed with it, his whole body broke out into such a flame and was so seized by the fire. This is this kid volunteers to get set on fire for Alexander. It, it's it's worth wondering what kind of um, what kind of presence he had to invoke that kind of loyalty, or if this is just an idiot kid trying to gain gain favor with the. Um, the leader. But then towards the end, all these superstitions kind of seem to be Alexander's downfall. And by the way, that has its parallel in the life of Wallenstein, um, you know, in the 17th century, towards the end of Wallenstein's life before he is murdered. You know, he dies under, well, Alexander dies under suspicious circumstances. We know Wallenstein was murdered. So Alexander seems to um, get into a bad place towards the end. And at a, the very young age of 32, he is killed. Uh, in discussing all of these things, like these astrological things and these alchemical things, I just think it's funny to talk about it. And it's worth remembering. The, uh, there's a line from Montaigne. I can't remember it exactly. But to paraphrase Michel de Montaigne, talking about things like this, he says, Beware of the day when the things you believe are more ridiculous than the things you deny and to beware the things that you dismiss out of hand. Thanks for listening.